Good morning. Welcome to morning worship here at Rising Star Baptist Church. I'm Bob Dabney. I will be doing the morning meditation, reading from the book of Psalms, Psalms 54. Psalms 54. Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayers, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. Lord is my Lord is with them. Lord is not with them, but the Lord is with they that uphold my soul. He shall reward, he shall reward evil unto my enemies. Cut them off from the truth. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I praise thy name, O Lord. For it is, it is a good thing. For he hath delivered me out of my trouble. My eyes have seen his desire upon my enemies. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We look to you. We say thank you. Thank you for all you do, Lord. You are the lifter of our heads, Lord. We thank you that you deliver us from every evil, from every trouble. Lord, you have saved us time after time after time. And that is why we look only to you. We don't look to the government. We don't look to mankind. But Lord, we come on the Almighty, Lord God, our Savior forever. Lord, you've been with us from the beginning, Lord. And so we know that we can count on you forever. Lord, we ask that you would save us now in this pandemic. Save us in the suffering and the death that surrounds us. Our hospitals are overrun. Our funeral parlors are overrun, Lord. We just say, deliver us now. Lord, we count on you. We know that you're able, and we know you will when you're ready. You are a sovereign God. You do what you will do when you're ready to, Lord. And so we patiently, we confidently look to you. We count on you day to day, and we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, for we have become accustomed to your blessings. We, we count on having food and shelter every day, Lord, but we know there are those that don't. We know that we can't take it for granted. We know that we must humble ourselves and pray always, counting on you to be there for us, trusting you even for our salvation, Lord. Lord, you guaranteed our salvation when you died on the cross. When you descended unto hell, Lord, you took our sins with you. You delivered us from them. Lord, there no, they no longer can hold us. We do not have to pay the penalty for sin. No one who trusts in you. You've already taken care of it. But we just say thank you. Thank you for all your blessings, Lord. Thank you for each and every day of our lives. And we pray and ask all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
wanted to just share how special this young man is, Lewis Russell. A few years ago, I got a call and someone asked me uh, to meet this young man, Lewis. At the time, I believe he was seven years old. And um, so I, I met Lewis and this young man for the last two, two and a half years has become my grandson, my first grandson. Uh, I, I love him to death.
to exalt you. Because you deserve our very best. What an honor it is to stand in your presence. God, we we pray right now that your spirit will continue to reign in this place. Lord, will you have your way? Will you challenge the hearts of your people? God, we just thank you so much for
Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, we see the occasion for God's providence. In verse 3, it says, In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants. And in this banquet, he displayed his, his riches. And so the occasion was a party, 187-day party. Six months they had a party there in Persia. And then, of course, we saw all of the opulence of the king. This was the who's who in the kingdom. I later found out that they really were planning for war. This is significant as we move into chapter 2. They're planning to war with Greece, and, and so this six months, they're doing this planning, and there's a whole lot of opulence, and, and there are drinks on the house. And then, in his drunken stupor, the king decides that he wants his queen, Vastine, to come and show all of the men how beautiful she was. So they move from the occasion to the opulence to the opposition. As you remember in verses 10 through 12, the Queen Vashti did not go. And in deciding not to go, Queen Vashti was basically, her, her crown was taken. She was no longer able to be the queen. And so last week we looked at the occasion, the opulence, the opposition of the king and the order, the opposition of the queen and the order of the king. And what the king did is he made a rule. And under Persian law, when you made a, 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 a law, it could not be changed. And so this is where we pick up here in chapter 2. Chapter 1, verse 22, it says, So he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province according to his script, and to every people according to their language, and to every man should be the master of his own house, and the one who speaks in the language of his own people. Chapter 2, the setup. After these things, the text says in Verse 1, after these things, of course, we know later through history that this is four years later, in between chapters 1 and chapter 2, four years go by. And so after these things, because what was happening is they were fighting a war, and they were winning initially, and then they lost, so they retreated back, and this is what brings us to where we are. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti. Point number one, the king remembers and replacement is planned. The king remembers and replacement is planned. There is no queen for four years because Queen Vashti was taken off of the throne. They fight a war that they were winning initially and then they start to lose, so now they retreat back and the book picks up here. King Asherah had subsided and remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces, 127 provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to, to the harem, and to the custody of Haggai, Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Ashtar. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Last week I was speaking with Sister Dagny, and she says, as I look through this book, it's a book of extremes. The king is extremely extreme. It's, it's, 
It's one to a hundred. And so now the queen is, is no longer the queen, and he's thinking about his decision. He's thinking about the fact that he remembered Vashti, and, and Vashti must have been a good queen because even after four years, the king is thinking about Vashti, and in his drunkenness, he, he caused her to lose her crown. Probably a good time to notice, not a good thing to make decisions when you've been drinking. You can blame it on the alcohol. I guess the king is blaming it on the alcohol. And so to get his mind off of things, his attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Now, when I was reading through this, it, I struggled, to be honest, and I struggled with how do I present this? How do I present this story? And the commentators, they don't really touch on it much, but the reality is, this is no Cinderella story. If you look a little bit deeper, there is a huge beauty contest that is going to take place, but here's the problem. There is 127 provinces. The king's attendance goes to each one of these provinces and they take these young virgins from their parents so that they can put these young virgins in the hands of the king. This is no Cinderella story. This is not like these young virgins uh, who are with their parents are saying, pick me, pick me. No, this is not that type of story. This is more like a sex trafficking, trafficking thing. Now, I, I, I thought all week about how I can say this, but there really is no way to say it other than the fact that they chose these young virgins for the king's pleasure. Now here's the problem. When the beauty contest is over, they are stuck under the rule of a king. These young virgins cannot get married. These young virgins are uh, particularly won't have children. The ideas of family carrying on the family name, all of that is gone because of the king's opulence. He goes from one to a hundred and a hundred and twenty-seven provinces. Historians suggest that it's perhaps 400 young virgins at the king's disposal. The king remembers and replacement is planned by taking these young, beautiful young women and adding them to the king's harem. And as you can see in verse 4, it says, then let the young lady who pleases the king and queen be placed in the place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. This king is, first of all, starting this, this party, 187 days, to show his opulence. And, and this was a good idea to the king. Now, he certainly wasn't a Christian king. He wasn't of the tribes of Israel, but nonetheless, God allowed this to happen. We're talking about God's providence. Why would God allow something like this to happen? Point number one, the king remembers and replacement is planned. Secondly, Verses 5 through 7, God's helping hand is provided through Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is a new character that's been introduced into this whole scheme of things. Verse 5 in chapter 2, now there was a, at the citadel in Susa, a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, a Jewish man. They introduced Mordecai to this scene. Verse 6, he said, 
who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Now, they had already prophesied that the children of Israel would be released, but not all of the people who were released went back to Jerusalem. Some stayed in the, in the places that they were. And so they let us know, first of all, that this character, Mordecai, he was a Benjamite, and he was in exile from Jerusalem, along with all the other captives. Now verse 7 goes on to say, he was bringing up Hadassah, which means murderer. Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. Now this was quite a noble man, Mordecai. He was actually not Esther's father, he was her cousin. It says he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now that tells us a little bit more about this character, Esther. She was without father or mother. You might think that's a bad situation, and indeed it is a bad situation, but ultimately God is setting up something. Even in the details of our lives, even in the negative things that happen in our lives, God is always setting up something. Listen, you got to understand this. Most of us, when bad things happen in our lives, we're crying out to God and we're saying, why? Or like Paul, we're praying that God would take these situations away from us. But ultimately, as believers, we should understand that God is working some things out. <clears throat> He's setting things up. Well, last week we talked about you know, God in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, there are reasons why God allows us to suffer. That was actually in Bible study on Wednesday. So God is setting things up. And, and, and quite often, the things that he's setting up, we are oblivious to. And because God is sovereign, he can do whatever he wants to do, to whomever he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it, how long he wants to do it, and, and he doesn't have to ask because he is sovereign. He is in charge. But often in his providence that his, his hands in the details of life, sometimes we don't see God's hand in the details of life. Even in our poor decisions, God allows it to happen and he providentially is working things out. He is setting it up for God's glory and ultimately our gain. So we see here, it says, Now there was at the citadels of Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemiah, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives, who had been exiled with Jeconah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Providence. This young woman lost her father and mother, but God made her beautiful. Not only in, 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 in other words, in fact, I looked it up to make sure that it meant what I thought it meant, and she was a brick house. <laughs> she was all that. She was beautiful in form and face. And so, you, you can meet some folk that are attractive, but once you get to know them, they, they're unattractive. Not Hadassah, 
Not Esther. She was beautiful in form and face. And by the way, these young women, they didn't have an option in this beauty contest. They didn't have an option of up and out. When the king, uh, when the king's attendant said, "Hey, you come," they went and they had to go and participate in this beauty contest. So we see in verses one through four, the king remembers, and the replacement is planned. The king wants a new queen, and so this big beauty contest happens. Number two, God's helping hand is provided through Mordecai. It's a beautiful picture. This Mordecai, this cousin, sees that this young lady has no one to take care of her, and he takes her as his own. That's God's providence. Listen, some, some of the things that you as you get older in life, some of the things that, that God has allowed to happen in your life, you might look back on those things and find that God was providentially using that negative thing for your good. I can't tell you the number of people that I've been able to be sympathetic to who had a parent that was incarcerated can't tell you the number of things that's happened in my life that I've seen God use to help others go through their struggles. Because usually when other folk are going through struggles, they believe that they're all they're going through the struggle all by themselves. And no one understands. And so your pain can ultimately be used for somebody else's gain. Amen. Let's look at verses 8 through 16, Esther joins the king's harem. Again, I was trying to find a more tactful way of looking at this, but this is no fairy tale story. I have to admit that initially I was looking at this like, wow, this is what, you know, how exciting is it that Esther would be chosen to be the queen? Not the case. Look at verse 8. Esther joins the king in harem. So it came about when the command and decree of the king was heard. Because this is a decree, and remember in Persia, when they make these decrees, they cannot be undone. It's not like the, the king can say, you know what, I changed my mind. No, it's, it's, it's settled. It says, so it came about in verse 8 when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa and to the custody of Haggai that Esther was taken to the king's palace into custody of, of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. So Esther is taken along with the other women into Susa, and she is under Haggai, who is managing this whole beauty contest. It says in verse 9, Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. That is, with Haggai. From the onset, God providentially allowed Esther to find favor with Haggai. Much like Joseph, when Joseph was sold by his brothers, God always showed favor to Joseph. No matter where Joseph was, God showed favor to him. When he was in prison, God showed Joseph favor. And listen, you need to understand, even though at times you're in an undesirable place, you can still have God's favor in an undesirable place. And so we get the, the privilege of seeing the whole picture and, and knowing the whole picture, but when life happens to us, we begin to give ourselves a pity party and not really understand that we still have God's favor. No matter what's going on in our life, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I know that I have favor, and if God is allowing it, then I can, I can rest in my circumstances. Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I find myself in. That's, that's learning how to do it. It's a process. You don't get it just because you're a believer. Initially, you've got to learn how to appreciate. You've got to learn how to worship. You've got to learn how to give God your very best no matter what's going on. Make yourself worship God. Make yourself praise Him. Make yourself get up and go to church and worship with the saints. 
of the command and the decree of the king was heard, and many young ladies were gathered to the citadel of Susa and to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace and to the custody of Haggai, who was in the charge of the women. Verse 9, now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him, so he quickly provided her with cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace and transferred her to the maid to the maids to the best place in the harem. So God's favor. Esther comes in, Haggai sees her, right off says there's something special about you. He gives her all the, the, the cosmetics that she needs because this is a year-long process in preparing to go before the king. They give her all the kings, uh, they give her all of these servants and cosmetics and they transfer her to the maids, to the best place in the harem. In an undesirable situation, God elevates her. He gives her favor. Remember when Joseph was in prison? Immediately, he was, they saw that God, Joseph had a God's favor. They elevated him in prison, and then several years later, he was elevated to second in charge. A true rags to riches. Verse 10 says this. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. In other words, Mordecai, being a Jew, says, hey, Adapha, don't share with the king, don't share with anybody that you're a Jew. He wisely does that because there is animosity, there is anti-Semitism, and so Mordecai wisely tells his adopted daughter to, listen, don't let anybody know that you're a Jew. Verse 11, every day Mordecai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. You can only imagine that Mordecai loved Esther. He raised her as a young lady. She was like his daughter. And so he's going back and forth to make sure that she's okay. And remember, this is not uh, America's next uh, top model. This is this one, these young ladies have been taken, stripped from their families, and now they're in the king's harem, and there's not anything that they can do. So Mordecai is at the gate going back and forth. Every day, he walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. Verse 12 says, now when the term, say the term, now when the term of each young lady came to go to King Ahasuerus after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for the women for the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh, six months of spices and cosmetics for women. The young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from, from the harem to the king's palace. And so basically, all of these young ladies had their turn with the king. They all went before the king. They had all of this fanfare. They had all of the cast of cosmetics. And they were ready to present themselves before the, before the king with hopes that maybe they would be selected to be the, the queen. The sad part is, some 400 of them, 300 and something of them, didn't get chosen. And they were just thrown into this harem. And they were separated from their families. They couldn't have children. This was not a good situation. But God is working in the details of life. Verse 14. Says in the evening she would go up, and in the morning she would return to the second harem. So basically, that's what would happen. They would go in the morning and spend time with the king, do whatever the king desired, and then they would leave. Thank you, ma'am. Not a good situation. And she would not again go into the king unless the king delighted in her. 
and she will summon my name. Can you imagine? I was just, again, I was trying to think through this and how could I make this more palatable? These young ladies go before the king and they're all beautified and they've got all of this stuff and, and, and he sleeps with them and then he kicks them out and then they don't hear from him ever again. This is basically stuff, sex trafficking. There's nothing good about this. But God is in the detail, verse 15. Now when the turn, say the turn. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go to the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And here's the thing, these young women were not the first uh, uh, people, first young lady to be in his harem. He had others that were already in his harem. And no doubt when they went before the king and he says, hey, listen, you can take whatever you want, they in their minds are thinking, hey, listen, this might be the last time I get an opportunity to take something, so they would take whatever they wanted. And rightfully so. But it says that when Esther's turn came, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, had bought. That's God's providence. She didn't take anything. And it says, and Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the tenth month, which is in the month of Tadim, in the seventh year of his reign. The king remembers and replacement his plan in verses 1 through 4. God's helping hand is provided through Mordecai in verses 5 through 7. Then in verses 8 through 16, we see Esther joins the king's harem. And then now we get to verses 17 through 20, where we'll see that Esther harnesses the king's horse. She has the king written, wrapped all around her finger. Now why is this important? Well, let's just see. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Out of this bad situation, this young lady who lost her father and lost her mother had much to be angry at God about. Her uncle Mordecai takes her and raises her up. She is a beautiful woman, not only beautiful uh, in, in, in face, but she's beautiful inside out. And she wins the king's heart. It says in verse 18, then the king gave a great banquet. Esther's banquet. She has a banquet in her honor, going from losing parents to having nothing to be in an orphan to now being the queen, God's providence in the details of life. By the way, uh, young ladies, it doesn't matter what's happened in your life, you're still God's queen. You have value. Stop lowering the standard. You need to begin to see yourself the way God sees you. And when you see yourself the way God sees you, don't, that there can't no God come and try to tell you how fine you are. You ought to already know that you are God's queen. He shaped you and formed you and knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. You have value. You don't need somebody else to tell you how fine you are. You ought to already know that. Verse 18, then the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all the princes and his servants. He also made a 
holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. So she's, she has a holiday in her honor. Verse 19, when the virgins were gathered together a second time, then Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now, of course, in the first century at the king's gate, this is where they took care of issues of the law. And so it could be said that Mordecai is now elevated because of his relationship to Esther. He is sitting at the king's gate, it said. Esther had not yet made known her kindred or her people, even as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther did what Mordecai told her as she had done when under his care. That's God's providence, and you're going to see next week how God's providence plays out. Let me just get to the last three verses. We've seen in verses 1 through 4, the king remembers, and a replacement for the queen is planned. In verses 5 and 6, God's helping hand is provided through Mordecai. Mordecai is introduced in here in verse 4. We see that he's spoken of also. Thirdly, Esther is joined to the king's harem in verses 8 through 16. Verses 17 through 20, we see that Esther has the king's heart. And lastly, this morning, we'll see Mordecai saves the king by what he hears. Mordecai saves the king by what he hears. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, providentially sitting at the king's gate, Mordecai just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And listen, you might say that's luck or that's happenstance. I say that's God's providence. Something ever happened to you and you say, whoo, you know, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. No, that is, that is God's providence. Think about what has to happen for someone to be born. And you follow that all the way back to the very beginning. God's providence. Your mom and dad had to hook up with it. In order for your mom and dad to hook up, your grandmother and grandfather somewhere down the line had to hook up. And they were probably uh, light years away from each other. In order for your great grandmother and great grandfather to get together, God providentially had to put somebody in place for your great 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 grandmother to, to notice your great 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 grandfather. And you look at God's providence all the way back. And then you look at you, and you ought to know that you are here on purpose. You are here on purpose. You are not a mistake. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you made in life. God providentially has you here for such a time as this. And so it says, in the days while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, who are the king's officials, from those who guarded the door, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So Mordecai is positioned. He hears that these two men got a problem with the king. Esther is now the queen. And of course, if the king is, is killed, that's certainly going to affect Esther. And so Mordecai is listening in. He says, but in verse 22, the plot became known to Mordecai. You think that plot became known just by chance? God providentially put Mordecai in the place where he could hear of this plot. And it became known to Mordecai, and he told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. Notice that. Now, the king does not know that 
Esther is a Jew. She does not know that he does not know that uh, Mordecai is her cousin, or her basically her her cousin. And so the queen he tells Hadassah, uh, Mordecai tells Queen Esther, "Hey, listen, I heard about this plot. They're gonna try to kill the king. So go tell the king about this plot." And she does that in Mordecai's name. He says, listen, they're trying to kill you. And, and, and don't forget, I got this information from this guy named Mordecai. It's a setup. It's a setup. And then in verse 22, it says, verse 23, now when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book, say the book. This book is going to come back up. Providentially, it's going to come back up. It was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. God's providence is God's hand in the small details of life. Even the negative things that happen in our lives, you've got to trust that God is working it out for good. And so, on next week, we're going to see this character, Haman, that's introduced to the scene. And, God, how, and how God providentially uses Esther and Mordecai for the saving of the Jewish people. I want to go on, but i got to stop. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the small details in the setup of our lives. Lord, many of us have made major mistakes in life. And you have used those mistakes for your glory. It doesn't mean that hurt doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that we don't have to experience the consequences of our decisions, but we take great courage in knowing that God is working all things out together for the good. To those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. God, we just pray right now that your word will penetrate in our hearts as we go through this book. Will you challenge us to trust you in the midst of difficulties, give us the grace to trust you, knowing that you do all things well, and you're working all things out together for my good and your glory. And so, God, as we look at the life of Esther, this young widow, and we see how you have providentially moved in her life, even to her beauty. You made her beautiful. You gave her favor. And so now, Lord, we look forward to seeing what it is you want to say to us through this word. The songwriter says, I will trust in the Lord until I die. So, Lord, give us the grace to trust you when things are not comfortable. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want you to think deeply about God's providence. I want you to think about what's going on in your life. 2021, you still are experiencing a lot of death through COVID. You're still in the pandemic. But God's providence has brought you to this place and time. Perhaps you don't know him as your Lord and your Savior. Perhaps you've heard about him for many days in your life, but you've not asked him to be the Lord in your life. 
should have taught you that we don't take any days for granted. And so if you have a desire to be in a right relationship with God, you do so by faith alone in Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And so if you're here and it's your desire, even if you're looking on Facebook, you're looking on the, the gospel is plain. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. And that is Jesus Christ died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was buried, and God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. And so if you desire to be saved, if you desire to be in a right relationship with God, I want you to pray this prayer. Lord God, I admit, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, and I need your salvation. My life is a mess. And without you, I can't make it. I can't, I can't fix myself. I can't change my circumstances. But you can change me. And so God, I pray that you would change me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he was buried believe that God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. So now I place my trust in you alone for salvation. Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given to those that believe. That empowers us to live a life that we could not live without you. Give us victory in every Yes.